While occasionally referencing real-life people and events, the following is a work of historical fiction based on first-hand historical documents featuring both real and imagined dialogue and contains adult language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. Three strangers' lives are changed forever after chance meetings in Jim Crow, Mississippi during the 1930s. This is their story. Lord, thank you for another day above ground. Lord, Please give me the strength to make it through another day. Lord, please help these people to see the error in their ways. Thank you for this roof over my head and these shoes on my feet. I have nothing left to give this man, this cruel, cruel man. The way they treat their fellow man. Thank you for the opportunity to work. I work and work and work, and he takes and takes and takes. They have the devil inside of them. Thank you for the opportunity to make my parents proud. I don't know how much more that I can take of this. I don't know how much longer I can be among these people. Lord, help me to make a difference in the lives of others, and, if I may ask you, to help help me find find somebody somebody to to love. God, let your voice be heard, and above all else, let let me me be be understood. understood. Tupelo, Mississippi. Did you hear about the Rudys? No. What happened? They moved to Chicago. What? Why? Their son got into a scrap with some little white kids and been pushing them around. That night, while they were sleeping, someone set a cross on fire on their lawn and shot out their windows. So they packed up and left. So they just up and left for Chicago? Just like that? They got family up there. Oh. You know what? I've been thinking. What if we moved up north? 
What? Yeah, you know, we got cousins in Peoria we can stay with until we get settled. But Tupelo is home. Yeah, but home just ain't safe anymore, man. Willie, you and I both know that it never was. A lot of Negro folks are getting up out this part of the country. Going north gives us a fighting chance. We can actually use our hands to build things in factories up there instead of using the clean toilets down here. There's this one cat. He's making three times what he made down here. Three times? You serious? Yes, sir, and that's just the beginning. You can actually go to school like you've always wanted. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Hot damn. Let's start putting the wheels in motion. Morefield, who's your dream girl? The one girl you'd give it all up for. Man, you can keep the girls. I need a woman. You know what I mean. There's only one woman for Morefield Scott, and that's Billie Holiday. There's a woman, all right, but she ain't the best. Is that so? And who, perchance, did you have in mind, little brother? Pinky Buma. <laughs> What's the commotion? <laughs> You're in love with a white woman? <laughs> yes. <laughs> did I say something funny? You ain't got no business pining over no white lady. We're just talking fantasy is all. And you better keep it fantasy, Willie. Those white men will kill you before they ever let you in the same room as her. Look at what they almost did to that kid for sticking up for herself. That was the glorious, glamorous, and gifted Pinky Bumer with her lovely little number, Souls of Your Shoes. She'll be barnstorming her way through the South this summer with stops in Atlanta, Birmingham, Jackson. TVA. Looking for work? Want to help your fellow countrymen? The Tennessee Valley Authority has you covered. Help bring new electric power to your area by working for the TVA. The drought is on as the Farmer's Almanac predicts a dry, steamy summer. Heal your heart ministry's tent revival. Ten minutes. Come heal your broken spirit next to nothing cost. Starting in ten minutes. Is there going to be a revival tonight? I want to see a revival. Not for you, boy. Heal your heart ministries. Ted revival. Ten minutes. The Lord wants us to love one another. He commands it in Mark 12, 31, that thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't just mean your neighbors to the left, right, front, and back. He didn't just mean your neighbors in your congregation, or where you work, and in your schools. And he certainly didn't mean just your neighbors that look like you. He meant all of your brothers and sisters in Christ, of every denomination, creed, or color. Hush now, and know it to be true. We are all the same in our Savior's eyes. Hey, good news, little brother. Looks like your dream is about to come true. You got a lead on jobs up north? No, I mean it looks like your dream is about to come true. Man, what are you talking about? Your dream girl is coming to Jackson. Pinky Buma. In the flesh. When? She's doing a residency at the Century Theater at the end of the month. Oh boy, this is my chance. Your chance? Have you lost your mind? What? Have you forgotten where you are? Well, this is Jim Crow country, and Jackson is even further down south. They ain't gonna let you anywhere near that theater. What's the harm in just hanging around? Hanging around? Hanging around? Little brother, if you forgot what they did to your daddy? No. Don't get hung up on that white woman. The devil follows wherever they go. You know what I mean, don't you? Yeah, Willie, I do. Look, I need you to promise me that you won't be going to Jackson. 
I promise. I promise what? I promise I won't be going to Jackson. Remember, Willie, Negro's life is a very cheap thing in Mississippi. I know. Now let's get cleaning before we both lose our job. Singing? You're not even going to let me settle in, are you? You were flat the whole second act. How am I supposed to sell a singer to promoters who can't even sing on pitch? It's fucking embarrassing. You're an embarrassment to me. I'll try harder next time. There won't be a next time if you keep that act up. I mean, Jesus Christ, Pinky. You keep talking about wanting to break into bigger markets and venues. There's no audience for a no-talent tits and ass singer. My audience likes me. Shut the fuck up. These idiots will know talent if it punched them in the face. You disappoint me, can't sing, can't give me a baby. How many times do I have to tell you to stop mentioning that? I'll bring it up as much as I goddamn want. I don't know why you're getting so upset. I'm the one out here doing all the work. All you do is sit backstage and drink. What the fuck did you just say to me? I said, I'm the one doing all of the work. All you do is sit backstage and... Atlanta, Georgia. For scripture says in Romans 13 that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So I ask you, why is it so hard to love your neighbor, the one who only differs from you in the color of their skin? Fuck you. Are they too not your neighbor and therefore deserving of the fulfillment of God's law of love? Fuck you! Get off the stage! I just don't understand! There's nothing to understand, you fucking monkey lover! Oh! Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, Miss... Pinky? Hey, did this boy hurt you? Oh, heavens no. I believe I ran into him. Why don't you get out of here, Nick? Goodness gracious. I said it was an accident. You don't have to muscle this young man around. But... But nothing. I pay you, and you'll do as I say, and kindly leave. Urgh. Allow me to apologize for my awful brood. I'm the one that should be apologizing, Mrs. Bumer. That's Miss Bumer. Handsome. Miss, I thought that your husband was your manager. You're spot on. Was my manager. Was my husband. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Why? <laughs> I'm not. Oh? The dog was a booze hound who... Ugh. Well, it doesn't matter. Let's just say it was a uh, less than amicable divorce. Hence the heightened security. I see. Got a name, handsome? Uh, yes, yes, Willie. Willie Jenkins from Tupelo. Whoa, Willie Jenkins from Tupelo. You came a long way to see little old me? Yes and no, ma'am. I did come all the way from Tupelo, that is true. But see, you know, the, the show was whites only. What a cruel world we live in. We are all children of God, no less than the trees or the stars. You have just as much right to be here as anyone else. That's all right, ma'am. I am such a big fan, I figured I'd hang around back and maybe catch a glimpse of you. That would be all that I needed, ma'am. Pinky. You can call me Pinky, handsome Willie. Yes, ma... I mean Pinky. Yes, Pinky. Sorry you couldn't see the show. Maybe I'll have to give you your own private show. Oh, Pinky. 
You don't have to run back to Tupelo right this minute, do you? Um, no, no. I suppose not. I'm sure there's another bus heading north in the morning. There's a place called Smith Park that's two blocks left and one block right from here. Meet me there after dark. Do you think that's safe? It's Sunday night. These people have work in the morning. Pinky? Where are you? Over here, handsome Willie. Oh, Miss Pinky Bumer, you scared the daylight out of me. <laughs> well, allow me to put some right back into you. Oh, Pinky. Wow, Miss Pinky. Here, come sit. Now tell me, Willie, what's life like in Tupelo? I work at the Tupelo Cotton Mill as a janitor. Tupelo Cotton Mill? Wait a minute. Are they part of the Tupelo Garment Company? Yes. And they make those workman shirts woven from the fabric with the fancy pattern. Oh, what's it called? Tupelo Magic. Yes! Oh, those shirts are so darling. Yes, Miss Pinky. What about you? Me? Yes, Miss Pinky. What's your story? Well, not much to tell, I suppose. I grew up singing in the church. A church girl. I love my Lord. Me too. I sing lead every Sunday in the choir. I suppose they like my voice well enough because everyone encouraged me to keep singing, so I did. I eventually met my husband who started managing me. Well, my ex-husband and manager, I should say. Do you still go to church? Not as much as I should. I live on the road and finding a church every Sunday is challenging. What about you? Yes, ma'am. Every Sunday. As soon as service ended this morning, I ran to the bus station to come see you. Nothing's going to stop me from being with my Lord. This has been so lovely, but I must be getting back before there's suspicion that I left. Would you mind to give me your address so that I can stay in touch? Do you think that's a good idea? I mean, a white woman sending a letter to a Negro man? Hmm. I suppose I didn't think about that part. How about this? There's a barbershop in my neighborhood that I frequent often. Sending the letters there may be safe. That's a good idea. Do you have an address? Of course, Miss Pinky, but I'm afraid that I don't have a pencil. Don't fret over that, handsome Willie. I have a photographic memory. All you must do is tell me at once, and it will never leave me. Oh, okay. 300 Elliott Street, Tupelo, Mississippi, 38804. Thank you. Okay, handsome. Just to be safe, you better not go anywhere for five minutes after I leave to make sure the coast is clear. Yes, Miss Pinky. Oh, Miss Pinky. Yes, handsome Willie. Is this heaven? <laughs> Magnolia Springs, Alabama. Postcards! Get your postcards here! Young man, why are you selling those? Gee whiz, mister. I'm just trying to make some money. Postcards! Commemorative lynching postcards here. Two cents. Dear handsome Willie, I trust that you made it back home to Tupelo safe after our little soiree in the park. I can't stop thinking about that night with you. You were such a gentleman, and I loved learning more about your life in Tupelo. Tupelo has such a pretty ring to it. I should use it in a song, perhaps about a star-crossed lover. We are heading west on tour. I could be convinced for another stop in Mississippi on our next eastward swing. 
What dreams do you have for yourself, sweet Willie? What is it that you want to do with your life if you could? Do let me hear from you soon, handsome. Lovingly, Pinky. Oh, Miss Pinky, you have made my life oh so gay. To think, just a little while ago, I was some faraway admirer. Now, I have you writing me letters. You should know that things like this never happen to a poor black boy from Mississippi. Never in his wildest dreams did he ever think this day would come. How long have I had to listen to everyone say Billy Holiday this and Billy Holiday that? While I do admire Miss Holiday's talent, I'd always tell them, you haven't heard an angel sing until you've heard Pinky Buma. Tupelo would be lucky to have you, and you're welcome here anytime. I would love to go to school and become a teacher. I was never allowed to go to a proper school because of the color of my skin. It has always been a dream of mine to go to school to teach kids and to be able to give them opportunities that I never had. Love, Willie. Handsome Willie, you have stolen my heart. What a lovely aspiration. You will get that education and you will get to make a difference in the lives of young people. I just know it. A lot can come to a kind-hearted man. It shouldn't matter the color of his skin and you, Willie, are a kind-hearted man. As for the musical comparison, there's none to be made between Ms. Holiday and I. She is the one true talent in popular music. A once-in-a-lifetime voice the likes of which we have never heard and will never hear again. <laughs> Lovingly, Pinky. P.S. It took some doing, but I was able to convince my promoters to make a stop in Tupelo during our next Southern tour. I will be heading your way at the end of the month after next. I did it! You did what? I got us all set up to move to Peoria. What? Yup, I got us a place to stay. I even got us jobs. Good factory jobs. And this time, Willie, we won't be cleaning toilets. We'll be on the line and part of the union. The union, Willie! When do we start? In the next month. Oh. Oh what? Don't you, uh, don't you think this is moving a little too fast? Too fast? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you expect us to just pack up everything and move away from the only home we've ever known just like that? Man, the only home we've ever known is filled with people who want to kill us. Willie, aren't you tired of living like this? I know, and I am. It's just... just... Just what? What if we, uh... What if we... What if we got jobs with the TVA? The TVA? Yeah, they're working to bring electricity to Tupelo. Man, those are white people's jobs. The TVA ain't hiring no Negroes. Willie, this is the best chance we got to get out of here and start a better way of life. Can't we just take a couple days to think about this? I guess, but not too long. We have to move quick if this is going to happen. President Roosevelt will be visiting Tupelo to celebrate the town becoming the nation's first TVA city. The President and First Lady Eleanor will be on hand commemorating Tupelo in a ceremony at Robbins Field. Earlier this year, the city of Tupelo signed a contract to buy electricity through the Tennessee Valley Authority. The Roosevelts won't be the only celebrities visiting the small northern Mississippi town. Miss Pinky Bumer will be performing for the first time in Tupelo next month. No end in sight for this heat wave. I'd hate to be a sharecropper this summer. It's been like a desert all throughout the South. Hello, dearest Pinky. 
I cannot tell you how happy talking with you these last few weeks has made me. How I long to see you and be in your warm embrace once again. You are the part of me I lacked. The mother I never knew. The love I never had. I cannot wait to see you in a few short weeks. Goodbye for now, my love. Mind the way you go on your way back to me. Love, Willie. Oh, my love, how happy you have made me as well. I never thought I would find another lover after leaving my husband. I thought my heart would never be ready. And then I found you, my prince, handsome Willie. It, it won't, won't be long, long until we're until together, we're together again, again, my love. Hey, little brother. We need to make a decision about... Oh! What you reading? Uh, oh, nothing. Nothing, big brother. Oh, come on. I heard you reading something out loud. What is it? Nothing, really. Come on, let me see that. No! Oh, my love, how happy you have made me as well. Moorfield, please stop reading. Who wrote this? Pinky? Pinky Bumer? Is this some joke? Why is Pinky Bumer sending you a love letter? We kind of met. Kind of met? Willie, tell me you didn't go down to Jackson. Yes? Yes? God damn it, Willie. Didn't I tell you not to go down to Jackson to chase a white girl? Yes, but... But what? I told you, no one like us has any business trying to talk to a white woman. How'd you even meet her? I know they weren't about to let you watch her perform. I hung out behind the theater to try and catch a glimpse of her, and suddenly, she appeared. And how'd you get this woman to send you letters? We met up at a city park after dark. You met her in public after dark? It was her idea. When else would I ever get a chance like this? Well, man, I'm glad she ain't tell you to jump off a building. Didn't I tell you how dangerous this was? Please explain to me how you could be so stupid. Because I love her. <laughs> love? Shit, you done done it now. You done lost your goddamn mind in love with a white woman. You might as well paint a bullseye on your chest. That shit's gonna get you killed, little brother. I can't help it. I've never felt like this before. Well, you better start to help it. That shit gonna get you strung up like your- Don't say it. That's not gonna happen to me. Bullshit is not. Wait, wait. Pinky's coming to town next month, isn't she? Um, um... And she coming to see you, witch. This is why you wouldn't come in to Peoria, wasn't it? You had this planned all along, didn't you? Answer me! Kinda? You stupid motherfucker. I'm gonna tell you exactly what you're gonna do. You're gonna forget all about this Pinky Bumer girl. You're gonna stop writing her letters. You're gonna forget this whole thing ever happened. You're gonna move to Illinois with me. But? No buts. It's over, Willie. I'm sorry. But for your own good, for your life, it's over. I won't. Willie! I won't do it. Man, they're gonna kill you. No. God will not allow that to happen. What? I love this woman, and God will make sure that we will be safe together. Man, I can't. I just can't anymore. I've tried to reason with you. I went out of my way to help you get out of this situation we're in down here, but I'm done. If this is what you want to die for, I won't stop you anymore. I'm leaving for Peoria. But one last piece of advice. Don't bring your love letters from a white woman to a building full of white men, idiot. May God have mercy on your soul. Hey, handsome Willie. Long time no right. Have I said something wrong? Still lovingly yours, Pinky. Oh, no, 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 Miss Pinky. It's nothing that you did. It's me. Honestly, Pinky, someone close to me caught me reading a letter from you and feared what would happen to me should someone find out about our exchanges. While my feelings for you are unchanged, I can't say that I do not disagree with his concern. I have known several men who have disappeared for far less than our innocuous conversations. 
while there is more built-in safety in our exchanging of letters than there would be in person secret rendezvous. You being in the public eye puts us at greater risk, for the fact remains in the eyes of our community. I am a ravenous Negro, and you an innocent, defenseless white woman. A heaven-bound defense when left to a lawless mob. Why would God allow such a thing? It's just not safe and I can never forgive myself should my actions cause you harm. Still, I love you, Willie. Oh, handsome Willie. Dear, sweet, handsome Willie. Please do not lose the faith. You know that I do not think of you in that way. But how foolish of me to not consider extenuating circumstances. While I do know the world can be a cruel and unforgiving place, I could never begin to fathom the world from your point of view. How scary that outlook must be. Thank you for opening my eyes to the pain so many live with. Oh, how I wish that I could do more to calm your fears, my dear Willie. I have known fear, albeit a different fear than the one you speak of. The fear of a man. A man who was supposed to be my lover. A man who hated himself so that he took all his pain out on me in the most vile, violent ways imaginable. Never one to offer praise, but quick to point out faults and remind me of my shortcomings and the ways in which I was inadequate to him. My lips to God's ears, I have not known any fear since the day that you came into my life. Should the echoes of life trouble you, my love, remember the positive difference that you have made in my life. Whatever God has planned for us, whatever shall come our way, I will embrace it with open arms, for I have you, Willie. I love you, and I will see you again soon, my love. My dearest Willie, I thought of you all during the show last night and wanted you with me. It is too bad that we cannot be together always. My love for you is greater than you can imagine. Sometimes I become so disgusted with conditions in this country that I want to leave and go to some place where people are sensible, where I can at least walk the streets with you in the daytime without danger and fear. You often impress on me the fact that you are colored and can't take chances. I know that, darling, but love is greater than color in my case, and we must do the best we can until both of us are in position to leave for good. I suppose you got the package I sent by mail to the barber shop for you. I have to be careful in buying things on tour because of my nosy security. I bought a beautiful shirt for you, similar to the famous Tupelo mattress pattern that would really bring out the color of your hazel eyes, but I had to give it to my cousin because my security saw me purchase it. Be good, my love. Yours devoted pinky Still looking to beat the heat? Relief may be coming to the good people of the South as forecasts predict rain sweeping through and saving the Bible Belt as early as next week. Excuse me, sir. I was wondering if you had a minute. I have time for all of God's children. You're a man of faith, aren't you? I am. I wasn't allowed to attend your revival tonight. Everyone has free and unlimited access to God's love. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. I'm listening. How long have you been traveling preaching? I got the call over 30 years ago. I've been on the road ever since. You go all over? I've crossed every inch of this country countless times, but I've been focusing my efforts on the South for the last few years. Why the South? Did you grow up here? Yes. Then you know why. God's good, clean, white country. God has left those people a long time ago. You believe that? Friend, I know that. Are you from down here? 
No, California ways originally. Is that right? Yes, my dad moved there during the gold rush. That's when he met my mom and settled down. Did they find anything? Does anyone ever find anything? If I didn't know any better, I'd say you are about as calloused as that Bible you carry around. <laughs> no, no, not callous. Tired, just very tired and weary. What, haven't converted enough Christians yet? There's nothing Christian about the way folks live down here. The way they treat their fellow humans. My name is Willie. Christian. Your parents must have known when you were born. Suppose they did. <laughs> you have the faith, don't you? I do. Yeah, I can see it on you. You hold fast to that. It'll keep you going. That's the thing. I think I've lost it. There's no thought. You either have it or you don't. I have it. It's just like you said, the people down here. I know. Your parents still alive? Oh, gosh, no. They died and I hit the road looking for salvation. That's what I want. Salvation. Well, you can't reach salvation from your rocking chair. What do you mean? Well, you're going to have to give blood. At least I'd be a martyr. That's not what I meant. I don't know why everyone romanticizes being a martyr. Don't they know part of that means having to die? You wouldn't die for what you believe in? Dying for what you believe in and choosing to die because you think it will bring you salvation are two very different things, my friend. I never considered that. Are your folks still with us, Willie? No. My mom died during childbirth and my father, uh... My father was lynched. Oh, my. My granddad became a Baptist preacher after emancipation. Fire and brimstone and the lot. He feared the world would end at any time. He passed that fear on to my daddy. He was paranoid. Smart, but paranoid wherever he went. Maybe he was just never the same after my mom died. I'll never know. Well, what happened to him? The white man my daddy worked for tried to pay him in Confederate money. He thought my daddy wouldn't know any better, but my daddy was no fool and proud like I said. He confronted his boss and, well, I guess the temper got the best of him and he struck that white man and that was that. Oh, heavens. I was nine when I watched my daddy burned alive. Before he died, I heard him say, Forgive them, Lord. They've gone astray. Now take me to my rest. And you've been looking for that redemption ever since. Yes. Yes. But how does one get past something like that? You don't. You just don't. Who raised you after that? My dad's sister and her husband. They had a little boy, my cousin Moorfield, a couple years older than me. I remember them teaching us to curb our ambitions, our curiosities, our self-confidences. Why would they do such a thing? That's insolence to the white man. Something like that could get you killed. Oh. You know, I never fully took their advice to heart. What do you mean? I've been having a secret romance with the white jazz singer. Oh, no. They'll kill you if that ever comes to be known. I know. That's what I'm talking about. Why fight the will to live if I have to hide my desires to be killed? Where's God in all this? Where is God now? Have the faith you say you have. You have to let that go. You ain't got a thing to hide. Not in front of me. I can't. I can't release the pain. It's too much for me to take. It's got a hold on me. It just won't leave me alone. I'm not going to leave you. I don't know. I feel that same tension in the air from when my father died. It's all around me, like it's closing in on me. I feel a curse like Judas is upon me. The same one my granddaddy and daddy spoke of. A mark of degradation fashioned with heavenly authority. You feel it too? I can never know it the way that you do. But I know a tribal sacrifice. And you and I have both seen how fast an aroused population can become an effective mob. I just want to make my parents proud. You have. You're alive. I heard a storm is rolling in. Do you think it's going to rain? We haven't gotten a drop all summer. I don't see why tonight would be any different.
While sorting the trash one day, a pair of white employees of the Tupelo Cotton Mill came across a couple of the love letters that Willie had accidentally left behind. When confronted about the letters, a scuffle broke out and a frustrated Willie struck a white foreman. Willie's badly beaten, near-death body was taken to the outskirts of town to be executed in the same manner as his late father. His charred remains were left on the side of the road of the main thoroughfare into the city of Tupelo. It was the first thing that greeted Pinky Boomer on her long-awaited visit to see her secret lover. On the night of his execution, as Willie predicted, it rained. American lynchings was a widespread occurrence of extrajudicial killings or the deliberate killing of a person without lawful authority granted by judicial proceeding, which began in the pre-Civil War South of the 1830s and ended roughly during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Lynchings in the U.S. reached their peak from the 1890s through the 1920s and primarily victimized ethnic minorities, especially emancipated slaves, at the hands of white supremacists. While primarily occurring in the American South due to the large African American populations that lived there, racially motivated lynchings also occurred in Midwest and border states. The origins of lynchings in America dates back to revolutionary times. The practice is named after the brother of a man who founded Lynchburg, Virginia in the 18th century. Captain William Lynch was a self-appointed judge who sentenced people to die without a proper trial. This method of condemning someone to their death by hanging was called Lynch's Law. Later, the act of hanging was called lynching. The definition of a lynching has gone through several iterations throughout the years. Generally, a lynching has been defined as a summary execution by a mob of an individual believed to have committed an alleged crime or a perceived transgression of social codes. In 1905, lynching historian James E. Cutler defined lynching as the practice whereby mobs capture individuals suspected of a crime or take them from officers of the law or break open jails and execute them with impunity that is to be found in no other country with a high degree of civilization. Cutler said that lynching was an undeniable part of daily life, as distinctly American as baseball games and church suppers. In 1922, a lynching was defined as five or more persons acting in concert for the purpose of depriving any person of their life without authority of law. In 1934, a lynching was defined as a mob or riotous assemblage composed of three or more persons acting in concert with the authority of law to kill or injure any person in the custody of a peace officer with the purpose or consequence of depriving such person due process of law all the equal protections of law. Today, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, defines a lynching as the public killing of an individual who has not received any due process. The NAACP goes on to say that these executions were often carried out by lawless mobs 
though police officers did participate, under the pretext of justice. Lynching invokes images of African Americans hanging from trees, but they involved other extreme brutalities, such as torture, mutilation, decapitation, and desecration. Some people were burned alive. A typical lynching involved a criminal accusation, an arrest, and the assembly of a mob, followed by the seizure, physical torment, then murder of the victim. Lynchings were often public spectacles attended by the white community where entire families, including children, accompanied with food and drink to watch the proceedings as a celebration of white supremacy. It was not uncommon for lynchings to be attended by thousands of spectators. Photos of lynchings were often sold as souvenir postcards. Mutilated body parts of the lynched deceased were viewed as highly coveted and valuable possessions to be taken from the lynch site back home to be proudly displayed in windows and other highly trafficked areas for public viewing and were held as precious family heirlooms that were passed down from generation to generation. The exact number of people lynched in America is impossible to know for certain due to decades of informal tracking. Best estimations of records maintained by the NAACP have the total number of lynchings in the U.S. from 1882 to 1968 at 4,743. Many historians believe the true number to be underreported. The highest number of lynchings reported in that time period occurred in Mississippi with 581 recorded. Georgia was second with 531, and Texas was third with 493. Lynchings did not occur in every state. There are no recorded lynchings in Arizona, Idaho, Maine, Nevada, South Dakota, Vermont, and Wisconsin. African Americans were the primary victim of lynchings with 3,446 or 72% of recorded lynchings being African Americans. Some white people were lynched for helping African Americans or for being anti-lynching. Immigrants from Mexico, China, Australia, and other countries were lynched as well. Males and females were lynched, as well as children. In some instances when the alleged perpetrator of a supposed crime could not be found, the person's wife, child, or other family member would be lynched in their stead. White mobs often use dubious criminal accusations to justify lynchings. Justifications varied, but the most sensational and commonly repeated excuse was a sexual assault against a white woman. Charges of rape were routinely fabricated. These allegations were used to enforce segregation and advance stereotypes of black men as violent, hypersexual aggressors. Accusations of other crimes included murder, arson, robbery, and vagrancy. The fear of a black uprising or slave insurrection was another central motif in white rationalization for extra-legal violence against African Americans though more restraint was shown to slaves due to them being seen as valuable property. Many victims of lynchings were murdered without being accused of any crime. They were killed for violating social customs or racial expectations, such as speaking to a white person with less respect than what white people believed they were owed. Really, any reason could be extrapolated into a viable justification to lynch a person. Many were lynched for no reason at all. If not apprehended in public, mobs would often overrun jailhouses to illegally seize alleged suspects to bring them to their public doom. The person outraged or their family, when possible, was asked to confront and identify their assailant and was given first dibs to participate in the killing. With no determinate way to classify cause of death, or pin down those responsible for the killing, coroners often gave official ruling in lynch deaths as death at the hands of persons unknown. Lynching was seen as a form of tribal sacrifice used to clear all of a painful spasm the white community needed to regain feeling of normalcy after a crime. So omnipresent was the fear of a potential lynching in the African American community that it influenced day-to-day -day life and decision making. Parents had to actively suppress curiosity, ambition, and self-confidence in their children due to fear that it would be seen as insolence or arrogance by whites and therefore worthy of a lynching. Lynchings in the American South were a catalyst for the Great Migration.
The Great Migration was one of the largest movements of people in U.S. history. Approximately 6 million African Americans moved from the American South to Northern, Midwestern, and Western states from roughly the 1910s into the 1970s. The driving force behind this mass movement was for African Americans to escape racial violence, pursue economic and educational opportunities, and obtain freedom from the oppression of Jim Crow laws of the American South. With war efforts ramping up in 1917, many able-bodied men were deployed to war zones throughout Europe, leaving many industrial jobs vacant. The labor supply was further strained by lack of European immigration and a standing ban on people of color in various parts of the world. This afforded the opportunity for the African American population to be the labor supply in non-agricultural industries. African Americans who migrated north after World War II were met with housing discrimination as localities began to implement restrictive covenants and redlining, which created segregated neighborhoods and laid the foundation for current racial disparities in wealth in the U.S. Attempts to bring awareness to the draconian practice of lynching were met with rebuffs at every turn for decades. The NAACP led the fight to bring recognition of lynchings into a mainstream focus for the U.S. population and the world at large. Grassroots activism set up boycotts of white-owned businesses. Anti-lynching crusader Ida B. Wells bravely composed newspaper columns to criticize lynchings. She also went on speaking tours of Britain in 1883 and 1884 to bring stories of the atrocities of American lynchings to horrified European audiences for the first time. In a July 1916 issue of The Crisis, the editor W.E.B. Du Bois published a photo essay called The Waco Horror that featured graphic images of the lynching of Jesse Washington. In 1919, the NAACP published 30 Years of Lynching in the United States, 1889 to 1919, to promote awareness of the scope of lynching by offering gruesome facts by number, year, state, color, sex, and alleged offense. From 1920 to 1938, the NAACP flew a flag from their national headquarters in New York City that bore the words, A man was lynched yesterday. This campaign turned the tide of public opinion and even persuaded some Southern newspapers to oppose lynching due to the damage caused to the South's economic prospects. In 1918, Congressman Leonidas Dyer of Missouri first introduced his anti-lynching bill, known as the Dyer Bill, to Congress. The bill was eventually defeated by a Senate filibuster. National lynching rates declined in the 1930s. The first full year without a recorded lynching occurred in 1952. Lynchings, though seen as disgraceful, embarrassing, and barbaric practices of the past, still occur to this day. The 1998 killing of James Byrd, who was chained to the back of a car by three white supremacists and dragged to his death in the streets of Jasper, Texas, the filmed killing of Ahmaud Arbery and the filmed killing of George Floyd in 2020 are three examples of modern-day lynchings. Finally, on March 29, 2022, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act was signed by President Joe Biden. After over 100 years and 200 failed attempts by U.S. lawmakers to pass anti-lynching legislation, the act finally designated lynching as a federal hate crime. On April 26, 2018, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice opened in Montgomery, Alabama. Founded by noted civil rights lawyer and activist Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative, the memorial and museum commemorates the black victims of lynchings in the United States. With a focus on and acknowledging past racial terrorism and advocating for social justice in America, the museum traces the African American experience from slavery through mass incarceration. The hallmark being a memorial that includes 805 hanging steel rectangles representing each of the U.S. counties where a documented lynching occurred, along with the names of each documented victim. Melby Dotson was quoted as saying that lynching was America's national crime. In pressing for the passage of the dire anti-lynching bill, the NAACP referred to lynching as the shame of America. 
Lynching was an expression of white supremacist racial instinct to defend what they saw as God-given boundaries of racial distinction. The most blunt and exacting tool used in the preservation of the white race that Americans ever wielded. Lynching is a lesson for the world of how rapidly an aroused citizenry can become an effective mob. Strange Fruit, the evocative and stomach-churning song written and composed by Abel Maripool and recorded by Billie Holiday in 1939, shocked many around the world for its graphic depictions of, quote, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. The lyric compares the after effects of a lynched body to that of a peculiar fruit hanging from a tree. The, quote, bulging eyes, twisted mouth, and the sudden smell of burning flesh became, quote, a fruit for the crows to pluck. The 1939 version sold over 1 million copies, becoming Holiday's best-selling recording. Heavy Head, Season 3, Episode 3, A Fruit for the Crows to Pluck, is written and produced by Tanner Hines, with additional engineering and recording by Tabari McCoy. Willie Jenkins and Revival Kid, voiced by Tabari McCoy. Pinky Bumer, voiced by Alicia DeVore. Christian, voiced by Chris Seamer. Morfield Scott, voiced by Phil Pointer. Ryan, voiced by Nick Noble. Radio broadcaster and revival barker, voiced by Lauren Hutton. Narrator, postcard kid, crowd member, and security, voiced by Tanner Hines. Narration and art design by Evan Verrilli. Award-winning original music by Real Blue Heartache Kids. Their music is available wherever you buy or stream music. If you or a loved one is experiencing a psychiatric emergency and live in the United States, please text or call 988 or text HOME to 741-741 for free and confidential support from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Crisis Text Line. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using the handle at HeavyHeadPod. Subscribe to our official YouTube channel, Heavy Head Podcast. You can email us at heavyheadpod at gmail.com. Please rate and review us on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. If you enjoy the show, please share us with a loved one. Lastly, merch is available at heavyhead.bigcartel.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you again next month. Until then, take care of yourself.